Hello everybody, welcome back to the Chess Geek channel. Today, from the 60 memorable games, we're looking at Fisher vs. Banco. And this game specifically is really interesting because it's the quickest game. The game ends in just 27 moves. Now, Banco is a really well-known player. He's the inventor of the Banco Gambit. He's a top-class player, but he gets destroyed really quickly in this game. And so I think this is a really illustrative game when it comes to ideas around attacking chess, playing with an initiative. And frankly, it's just a fun game to look at because it's a quick attack that was very, very successful. Sprinkled throughout this game, there's gonna be several key moments where I'm gonna urge you to pause and reflect on the position and try to find the continuation that Fisher played. Uh, and without further ado, let's jump straight in. So Fisher with the white pieces, he's playing e4, he's faced against the Sicilian, and black chooses a variation of the Sicilian where they essentially place both of their pawns on d6 and e6. Now this setup might seem passive at first glance. You look at these bishops, they can't really develop to a very aggressive square. However, this setup is also really solid. And the only way for white to really try to get a quick initiative or attack going against this setup is to commit very heavily with f4 and f5, with, which comes with its own risks. But Fisher, um, as you might expect, because I, I mentioned that this was a very quick uh, attacking game, he decides to go for this. So he tucks his king away on h1 to get out of this diagonal and allow for the move f4. Uh, we first have bishop g5, and now f4. Now, the issue with this sort of setup, of course, it's very aggressive. It can lead to very quick victories. There's a lot of bonuses, and it's it's definitely a fun way to play, very energetic. But it also definitely comes with some weaknesses. Specifically, the center is a little lost here. Uh, white usually goes for f5 and some assault on the king side. And um, if black is effective in playing on the, the queen side and maybe just simply on the center, developing the pieces and opening up the center, this attack might fail to get, uh, to get going and, and it actually might backfire this very aggressive um, play from white. Black goes for b5 here. Their intention is simple, they want to go b4 and carve out some space on the queen side, which is of course very logical, as I mentioned, white's playing aggressively on the king side, black usually then plays either on the queen side or in the center. We have knight to g3, opening up the way for the queen to come in, um, opening up uh, the knight as an extra now attacker as well, making ideas of f5 possible. We have the move b4, and this is the first moment that I, I urge you to pause and reflect what do you play here with the white pieces? So take some time to think about this. Now, in these sort of positions, it's clear that your intentions is to make a mess of the king side. And the move that uh, Fisher played here definitely follows in line with that sort of strategy. He went e5, and his idea is, let's just open up this position, make a complete mess of the, of the pawn structure, which will help me if I'm going for the quick attack and if black is lost uh, a little in the race of development. Now, you could certainly just consider moving the knight, but the other issue that with moving the knight is that it becomes a lot less flexible. The knight here on c3 sits really well in the sense that it can aid in some defense on the queen side, but it can very quickly also be a, a nice, uh, it can transport to the king side and be a, a nice helpful piece when it comes to the attack that white is conducting there. In fact, you'll see in this very game, this knight becomes a very nice uh, attacking piece. And so by ignoring the threat and keeping this knight flexible and instead going e5, Fisher is playing with a clear strategy and it definitely works and aids in the attack here. Now, the first question is, what if they take how will this uh, trade work? Well, this completely works for white uh, because we simply take here. We're attacking their bishop, so they have to take back. And now we simply go bishop h6 and it's already game over. The rook's attacked. Uh, notice that there's also this mate threat and they'd have to give away their queen in that position. So this is completely game over. So therefore, after e5, they decided uh, to take the pawn instead on e5. Um, and here, white decided to trade the knight in order to uh, stop essentially the knight's control over these light squares and therefore make this knight and the queen have a lot of mobility when it comes to aiding in this attack. We have knight to e4. Another benefit of e5, it carves out this square for the knight to be even more flexible. I talked about the knight being a good piece, a flexible piece on c3. Well, it is way more helpful here in the center where it is far more flexible and, and a, a more effective piece in general for white. 
The queen moves. Now, of course, you don't want to trade. You're trying to attack and expose this king. So the queen slides over to h5. And we have another question here. Black decides to take the bishop here. Now, first of all, I should note, they can't really take here. Um, because, well, okay, if you take the knight, they take your knight, and it's not so clear. Trading is not good for white here because they want to attack. But actually, white has a stunning and gorgeous resource here. I'd urge you to pause. This is a really nice tactic. What can white place here if they were to take that wins on the spot? The move is knight f5. Really stunning idea. The point is that after they take, I think this visually... Um, is very easy to conceptualize. This wall of pawns here makes it so none of these bishops, none of this queen, they don't have access to the defense of the king. The fact that this wall stands here means that as long as white can get an extra piece, there's no chance that black can sufficiently defend. This, this is kind of following in line with the notion that if your opponent's attacking, you want to open up the center to allow for there to be some um, fluid flowing for your pieces to kind of move around and defend. This is clearly showing the opposite side of that. The wall is really uh, harming the defense for black here. So knight f5, gorgeous idea. But for black seeing this, decided to instead take on b3. So the question is now, what do you play with the white pieces? Your third key moment, how can you continue the attack? Now, the first thing I want to mention is you can take here. That's a fine move, and, and it's not like you're worse. You still have some level of an attack going, but unfortunately, when it comes to attacking, tempo is really important, and there's cases, and the engine really shows this, where you have a very specific win, but if you wait one move, black suddenly has a defense, and here that's exactly the case. Instead of taking, there's a move here that wins on the spot, but after you take, black can take and start to open up the position, as I talked about opening up in order to defend, and although you're not losing here, you still have some initiative, it's not a winning advantage. Now, if we go back, what was the win? Queen h6, a very simple strategy. You want the knight to come in and you want this checkmate. For example, knight takes a1, knight h5, game over, black resigns. There's no way to stop mate aside from queen to g1. Now, going backwards, um, after the move queen h6, of course, black does not take the rook. They do uh, pose a slightly better defense. What they decide to do here, e takes f4, the best resistance they can. And their idea, knight h5, and now f5, opening up the defense and um, essentially asking white, how are you going to proceed? And that is exactly what I'm now going to ask you for your fourth key moment. What does white play here? that continues the attack. So pause the video and take some time. The correct move in this position is rook a to d1. Now, this also brings another notion of attacking. Sometimes when you attack, you're not gonna be able to checkmate your opponent. They're gonna be able to, in some way, make some concession that does manage to stop your attack. And you have to realize when is it the right time to cash out and trade down the pieces into a winning endgame. And if you do so in this moment, by giving this check, right? Forcing them to sacrifice their queen. Yes, you're up a queen, but then they take your rook and you take back here and white is better here. I'd prefer white. You still have some attack going. Sure, all of those things are true, but black is definitely back in the game. Their bishop can come. They can stop your rook from coming in, maybe start posing some of their own threats. You do not want to allow this. So instead of cashing in too early and allowing black some chances of drawing the end game, you first bring your rook to the d-file, attacking the queen. They have to move their queen while still maintaining it on this diagonal. It doesn't really matter where, but the whole point is now the rook is no longer um, eyed down by this knight so that we can now trade down into this endgame without fearing them being able to take the rook. And the resulting position is one where we essentially um, have an extra exchange compared to that previous endgame. And that makes all the difference. Um, unfortunately, now the, this position is, is completely crushing. The way that Fisher actually went, it on, went to convert this is queen to g5 and then queen to e7. Gorgeous concept, hitting the rook, hitting the knight. Um, the bishop went to a, a6, uh, trying to at least get two pieces. But at this point, uh, Benko realized it's time to resign. You're down uh, a full rook. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this game. Very quick one for today. A nice attacking, very smooth sailing game. Subscribe if you're new around here and you don't want to miss more games from this stunning book right here. And I'll see you guys next time. Peace out.